Welcome to School of Calisthenics TV with Tim and Jacko. We've got some great stuff coming up on this episode. We're going to talk calisthenics for sports performance. We are celebrating one of your graduations. And it wouldn't be right to leave you without a little movement challenge to have a go at. So we're going to bring a little bit of playtime into School of Calisthenics TV as well. And then we'll wrap things up with just letting you know all of the exciting things we've got planned for the rest of this year. Welcome to the first episode of School of Calisthenics TV, a slightly different format, giving Jack and I the opportunity to lounge and chat. Sit, get comfortable. We're in for a nice little ride here uh, in this uh, new format of content we've got. We want this to be as interactive as, as possible with you guys, so if you have any requests, the things you want us to cover, you have any questions, put them in the comments below and we will be able to add those to future episodes. So it's fair to say we're going to do a bit of an evolution. We're hoping to get guests on in the future. We get an opportunity to dive into a bit of training science, whiteboard sessions. We may even have a monitor if we can stretch to that. <laughs> um, but yeah, absolutely. I hope you guys are going to enjoy it as a slightly different take on what you may have seen in the past from School of Calisthenics. But we're looking forward to bringing a little bit of new, exciting content to the table. So the first feature we've got for you on the very first episode is our deep dive where we get to take a literally deep dive into a bigger topic of conversation. Timbo, what have we got for us in this first episode? Well, something that's been on the agenda a little bit for us recently over the last I don't know, a year or so, particularly since we started doing some work with the UK Strength and Condition Association, has been the use of calisthenics within sports performance. So we've done some work with a number of different organisations now, and we just thought we'd sort of have a, have a bit of a reflection on how people are using it, the feedback from coaches, physiotherapists, strength and conditioning practitioners about where they sort of see it fitting in because there's obviously a lot of people who are going to be playing sport looking at calisthenics and then starting to think about is it going to be applicable or useful in that training environment and obviously our background is in sports performance as practitioners and, and athletes and refer to you as that one Jack. I was a I never think it was a rugby player as an athlete I just think it's a rugby player I thought you were a professional paid person. We just don't person. think you're that just, we're just not that athletic. Yeah, I just rocked up on a Saturday <laughs> afternoon and tried not to get hurt. <laughs> That's exactly what I did. <laughs> but we, we thought we'd have a bit of a look at and, and chat around that. So let me throw the first question over. Yeah. General sort of like reflections in terms of when we first started thinking about using calisthenics as sports performance, probably fair to say is we didn't know how it was going to land. No. I think we, we'd experienced from our own training of how um, we were able to start to use or seeing how calisthenics was made and it really beneficial for the upper body and integration into the core and sort of the rest of the kinetic chain but it was very much like core shoulder based and so with athletes like some of the sw Paralympic swimmers we were working with it made sense to challenge them a little bit using body weight training calisthenics um, for that sort of upper body core control um, and then it just sort of people would just I guess we didn't set out to, to make that happen. I think people had, were, were using, we were talking to a number of different coaches that we had touch points with that had used it a little bit like us, a little bit with themselves, having to see some of the content and then started using it with athletes and really seeing the, seeing the benefits and sort of having that, that thought experiment, that idea of like, okay, but it makes, makes more sense to use this scenario, this that exercise over my normal bench press or yeah. overhead press for these reasons testing it out and then seeing it through and getting great results and so it sort of just snowballed from there I guess. I think there's one thing that surprised me a little bit is how many different people have got in touch and said oh, I'm using it for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or I'm using it to really help my triathlon training. There's lots of people who've, who've sort of just implemented it within the training and gone actually it's a really effective way of improving slalom canoe or whatever it might be. Particularly, we've done some work with rugby, and we've done some stuff with the Football Association recently, um, and obviously with the UK Strength and Conditioning Association, it's quite a broad mixture of sports. But I think the, the transfer over and why it works so well is, is, is with all of these sports, like when I did my first training, some of my um, initial sort of qualifications were around just understanding human movement yeah. and understanding that the human movement system is effectively like one big piece of muscle, whether we like to kind of chop it down into smaller bits, but it's one big system, all integrated, complex, lots of stuff going on. And what calisthenics does is respects that complexity and sport is a complex environment as well. So when we're talking about rugby as a good example, yeah. the chaos on the rugby field, having a system which has got a really strong peck from a bench press in an environment which is kind of changing all the time, having training the system in a more integrated and holistic way is probably going to prep you for better 
to better pr perform in that environment. Yeah. And I think that's one of the major things about calisthenics. It is not the golden bullet. Like we've said that in a number of presentations that we've done, it is that it's part of the puzzle. There is definitely a need in most sports to have a really strong lower body, powerful, explosive, plyometrics, back squat, deadlift, whatever you want to do. Yeah. That's 100% part of the puzzle. What we're probably saying with calisthenics is that this is, a, this is part of upgrading the athletic profile to be able to um, enhance physical literacy and then improve performance, which is actually going to go, you know, if you want to deadlift more weight or you want to shoulder press more weight, there's some movements within calisthenics which may well help that if that's part of the training program. Yeah. So we, like we've talked about this before, if you want to shoulder press more weight, just learn to handstand because I'm pretty confident that the neuromuscular connection and control around this, the, the shoulder and into the, into the rest of the body is going to improve your ability to shift more weight overhead. More yeah. joint stability, more force output. Yeah. So it's, it's using it for the right purpose, I think. But it, the, when you zoom out and you go, well, sport is total body movement, like we were chatting with the FA recently and Caroline with the physios there was saying like we, we need to really understand the importance of single leg stability because sprinting is a single leg exercise. Yeah. When we start to bring in some of the progressions in lower body calisthenics, they're really good for just building mobility and stability in that pattern, which you're then going to transfer through onto the park or the, the playing pitch. I just, I think there's it. That's, that, that for me is a big one, I think. Yeah. yeah, and it's using it as, like you said, using it as a tool as where does it fit appropriate for you so that if that example of saying someone needs to improve their overhead press and they have some handstand work as part of it, but ultimately understanding that that's going to form part of like improving that base layer, that if you are going to want to get really good at overhead pressing, you're still going to then have overhead pressing mm. in your program just because the, spe the specific adaptations are imposed. And as I said, principle of going, well, if you're still going to want to do that, then it's, yeah. it's not the answer of just one thing. But for some people um, that, that, that don't take part in sport and you do, you just like training for fun. It's like you want to go all in on calisthenics, like that's cool as well. It's probably where we're quite at in our own training. But then if you're, if you're looking at working in some of the sports that you're doing, whether you're in elite sport or whether it's just like you're playing whatever sport you do uh, for fun, then it might be able to form parts of your warm ups or parts of some bits of your weeks of your training. So we're just finding it nice to go, there's so much that we can do with it and then you can pick and choose which bits is going to be relevant to, to you, your sports, your goals, or the people that you're working with. And even from a starting point, if someone's listening to this and thinking, all right, well, how do I even start to integrate calisthenics? I play rugby, football, hockey, cricket, whatever. How do I start to integrate some of this stuff? I already have a gym program. Well, you can just so rather than doing a lap pull down, you might do start working a bit more on pull-ups. Yeah. And I think that you can integrate some of the progressions around chest pressing or, or that sort of stuff. And you go, I'm just going to do some of these like, more push-up variations and progressions which like we talk about push-ups but when you understand about the calisthenics you've got way more sort of yeah. uh, opportunity to scale it with intensity you can still make push-ups super super difficult like a really good example is we do a bit of work with some wheelchair racers and we've used planche progressions with those guys because it it's probably about as close to the pushing position we're going to get dips, barbell pre uh, bench press, rows are sort of have been staple parts of their program in the past. But if I can get them into a, kind of pr a planche pressing type position with the hips um, sort of like in the elevated position, like that's exactly where they're going to be in the chair. So my transfer from training effect is high, but I'm also getting integration from the shoulder and the hip. And we know the shoulder is going to perform well if it sits, it sits on top of a stable pelvis or a stable hip, and, and we can transfer forces between that system. And the great thing about that in calisthenics and it's transfer into sports is you can't cheat it. Yeah. If, you, if you can't create the right position, you can't stabilize the joint, you can't get into a good body position, then you can't do the movement. Whereas I'll show you many, many people who can somehow find a way of getting an extra two and a half kilos on a bar or five kilos on a bar, compromising position and still completing the rep or the set, but your quality of movement is yeah. pretty much fallen apart. And when we, when we zoom out and we go, well, what does like people who, are, who excel in their sport at whatever level, you know, I played like a really average level of rugby, but the people that perform well at that level were people who moved well. Yeah, they were just yeah. athletic and they yeah. could just do more stuff. Those guys that struggled just didn't have a particularly good athletic base to, to lean on. So if we want movements to be effortless and beautiful, then it needs to be integrated. And that's what calisthenics is going to help you to do. 
yeah. whatever then format you then go and start to implement it into from yeah. a sports specific perspective. Well, I think my final point on that is just picking up on your um, talking about progressions and variations and actually if I think back to what my training used to be like when I played professional rugby like I had very good coaches and everything we, we did lots of good work in the gym but it, if I think of what what bits would I use now from calisthenics it would be the the notion the idea to be a little bit more creative and less rigid like we would be so rigid with the with our hand position, with our feet position for squats, for bench press, for pull-ups. So we wouldn't really think about like challenging ourselves outside of just whatever was our norm or whatever we thought was like the perfect um, technique. And so I think with calisthenics by its very nature, because the progressive overload doesn't come from just putting a little bit more weight, a little bit more weight, a little bit more weight. It comes from changing a body angle, changing a lever length. It, it does by you just exploring and being a little bit more creative which I yeah. think I've certainly found as a training that's enjoyable, it's fun, I like trying to be creative like that, but then also as a coach, it's, it's, it's good to use to be a little bit more creative. It's, it's not boring yeah. because it's not just, it's a different way to provide that progressive overload. But you've got the continuum, haven't you? Because like when we look at the guys who are swimming, like we'll see people doing pull-ups with 40 kilos around the waist and the, the shape is horrendous. Back's bent out of shape, like range of movement's not amazing, but they're putting like a big tick in their pat on the back because they've done a 40 kilo pull-up. Where in the water, when we transfer them into a streamlined position and controlling body shape, like I really want the shoulder and the hip to be yeah. nicely aligned so I can catch and I can, I can move effortlessly through the water. So we'll often like, I've done it with swimmers before where they're doing pull-ups and like, right, strip it all back. I want that super strict line. Like I really want you to think about connection from shoulder, hip, so that we're moving like around, almost like we're on rails. Like quite rigid, I'm quite specific about that because that's where the transfer is going to come in. And they'll, they'll go from being able to do like, I don't know, so the argument so they can do puts of 20 kilos on, they'll go back to body weight and they'll yeah. be able to do like maybe eight or 10 or even less. Yeah. And it's a really humbling part of that. But when we're looking at sports performance from a strength perspective and strength training and strength and conditioning um, standpoint, it's about transfer of training effects. Like is what we're doing physically in the gym actually going to make us better? Yeah. It's like the famous quote from um, the rowing coach of like, does it make the boat go faster? And if it doesn't, then I'm not interested because yeah. that's the outcome. And that's a very performance-based mindset. If you're in recreational sport, then if you enjoy it and you enjoy training, it, the, 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 the stakes are far less. Yeah. But I think that's always like, if you've got that mindset of I'm training because I want to play well at the weekend or I want to perform well, what can you do in the week which is going to give you more ticks in boxes than what you are, and to then actually help you to improve the performance on the, in, on the, on your, in whatever sport it is you're doing. Yeah. And whether that's doing some more push-up variations because your sport requires like good postural control and good core activation, or you're trying to improve shoulder stability because you play a chaotic contact sport, that's where there's some of the, the stuff around yeah. um, that you can have a look at. And, and just to say that, if you're looking, if you, if you are coming from a point of wanting to know where calisthenics can improve shoulder performance, there's a presentation you can watch that we did at the UKSA, um, UK yeah. Strength and Conditioning Association, which is on YouTube. You can watch the whole thing. Um, so if you just type in School of Calisthenics UKSCA, you'll find that. And there's a bit of context in that around. Um, <laughs> up there, apparently, I'm being told. Um, it's, yeah, put a bit of context around how the shoulder can, can benefit from closed kinetic chain training, which is effectively hand fixed on the floor, bar, yeah. or in a gymnastics ring. Yeah, and so, so it's like understanding what you want from your training, because I just wanted to pick up on that swimming example, of being able to produce more and more force, like maximum force, like how much weight can you put on your pull-up? Yeah, I think the research project I did for my UKSA was something like five newtons of force that you would apply through the water with your hand. So it's like 16 kilos roughly. So it's so, not, yeah. what's the point in having more of that strength? You can't apply it to the moving water. Um, but then if you take something like rugby, where you're talking about being able to take high impact um, and being able to have like that, those ro that robustness around the shoulder to be able to absorb impacts in lots of different positions and scenarios, then having lots of strength in there and being um, reactive, like how in a muscle up we have to change from one position to another under maximal force and sort of strain, then that's where um, some of the more, let's call them the sexier movements in calisthenics yeah. can be important. And that's what we did when we went to, to Scotland rugby. Yeah. Um, I think that my, my sort of closing thought on this is gonna, we, we used this quote um, recently, but if you've got more movement options, you can move in more ways. And that sounds really simple, but 
What calisthenics is going to do for you from a sports performance perspective is it's going to improve your physical literacy. It's going to teach you to be strong in positions that we might not normally train in the gym in a normal bench press, bench row, dumbbell row, deadlift squat pattern, which is often very sagittal plane. It's going to move us outside and it's going to give you more movement options, enhance your catalogue of movements that your central nervous system has got access to. And then when you're confronted in a chaotic environment, and we refer to this as contextual variability of going, can you, have you got a movement system which can respond to the environment as the environment changes? The more diverse our physical literacy and athletic profile, the better we are equipped to, to respond to changes in the environment that we're playing in, and that means performance improves. So it's like, can you step, change, turn direction? Can you jump? Do you know where you are in space? It's yeah. all that sort of stuff which you just go, it's not about just like, how strong am I? You've got this whole physical other component to, to think about, and that's where calisthenics is going to give you a little bit of an edge. And if you can move in more ways than your opponent, and your skill and your technical requirements are being built up at the same time, then you have a really oppor real opportunity for competitive advantage. Shifting gears now, we're going to go into the Redefining Your Impossible section, Tim, and this is where we get to have a look at what you guys are doing and the amazing things all of you in the community are doing with your training. So it's time to celebrate a little bit of success, and this month we've got an incredible human flag from the legend that is Rob Falzone. Jacko, how would you like to pronounce that second name? Falzone. A little bit of Italian. Uh, he's not Italian, though. He's not. He told us very straight, right, correctly that it was Falzone. Rob has got a military background, some powerlifting experience as well, got a good training background, but moved on to trying some calisthenics when he got an injury. It meant that he couldn't kind of do anything with lower body base. I think it was a broken foot or toe that he was struggling yes. with. So he embarked on the human flag journey, got a gym set up at home. Join the virtual classroom and follow the human flag program. Have a little look at this one and see what you think. I don't know whether I'm what's more, uh, whether I'm more impressed or more um, a little bit jealous. He Intimidated. Held that bad boy for he got up there and then there was a little bit of an adjustment. And then you're like thinking, wait, that's it. And then it was like, I don't longer. I don't, oh, that, oh that, that's really long. It's probably longer than I can hold it. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to jump in in a second and show you a couple of things that Rob did really well. So you've got some practical takeaways that you can learn from, from his human flag performance. But before we do that, if you want to be featured as one of the celebrated members of the community doing awesome things and redefining your impossible, send us a video, landscape format, preferably shot in HD or some higher quality, don't like Sends a really ropey like <laughs> landscape uh, portrait wobbly phone. Send us something quality because then we can feature it, everyone can see what's going to go on. And also, if you've got any techniques or particular movements that you're working on that you want some specific advice with, we are going to do a technique breakdown analysis as part of it. So, if you are, if it's handstand problems, you've got something in your back lever, your muscle ups just not firing properly, send us a video. You don't have to do it perfectly, just show us where you're at. And Jack and I are going to put our heads together and come up with some coaching points so you're going to get some completely free and specific advice to help you to redefine your possible. Yeah, with, with Rob there, you see that he's, he's waited till he can do the end, the end thing, the full human flag. There's actually the most amount of value comes to you and everyone else watching out there when we were able to give you feedback and help along the way rather than just purely celebrating um, what you've managed to do at the end. We want to help you guys with your training, whatever it is you're doing, whatever it is you know, that impossible is that you're working towards. Um, and we can only do that if, we, if, you give us, if we're able to give you feedback along the way and along the journey. And so that's what this is about. There's details uh, in the description below about where to send those videos. Also in the comments, you can let us know some of the things that you're working on. If you've got any questions, you can connect with us there. But now, let's, let's show you yeah, let's what go Rob over did to nail that human flag. Breaking down some of the technique points then for the human flag that Rob did particularly well is focused around this bottom arm, the pushing arm of the human flag, and it being a real anchor. So we just want to like highlight a couple of points on this, just to help those of you that are working on redefining your impossible of the human flag. So too often people just come into a start position where they're really slumped in this bottom shoulder. And you see how Tim's chest is facing more towards me rather than opening up and turning 
chest towards you guys and actually then opening that bottom shoulder up. So it becomes a little bit of an issue sometimes for people around the mobility or flexibility to get into that position, but also, and most importantly, to be able to put force down in that position. Tim's actively pushing away with the shoulder rather than slumping. So even just because he rotates into there, he could still slump in and have that ear by that shoulder. No, he needs to be driving away in that nice shape. If we can't think about the framework that we're using in calisthenics, movement and strength, if Tim can't create the right movement, the right shape, in terms of creating this nice triangle of the arms and then having his body out to the side, if he can't create that force there, he's, uh, or that shape, he's not going to be able to apply force down. So in that shape there, he's just starting to dab his toes off the ground, and that's sort of your first step. Can you, with a, with a little triangle of strength, pushing with the bottom arm, pulling with the top, can you just dab the toes off the, off the ground? Ultimately, what Rob did nicely was he got up into that position, and what I want Tim to do is just do the tuck shape. So if he comes up in just to a tuck, and making this connection between this hip and this top arm pulling shoulder, he's pulling, pushing, and making a connection to that top hip and spending some time there where you've got the hip in completely the same uh, line, so parallel to the floor, is where the bread and butter, the base work of your, of your human flag needs to be. We don't need to spend time chasing with the feet out all of the time, that's just gonna slow down your progress. And what happens is you don't really often have the hip high enough, it starts to be a little bit low and you don't really make that same connection once you've sorted out that bottom arm. That's quite advanced for the human flag. That's for someone like Rob that was like very close to getting to there. Well, he was at the end, but the last phase of that training. If you want to work on how to build it up right from the start, we've got our things like our stability ball flag, our angle flags. All of those are in the, the human flag program inside the virtual classroom if you're wanting to know how to build up to that stage. Because getting to a talk is pretty difficult, but once you're there, you have broken the back of your human flag. It's time for a movement challenge and it's this week we're looking at Tim is coming at it with a bit of a strength based element and going to put me through my paces a little bit aren't you Timbo? I'm going to try. Because you've got a bit of a, you've got a, bit of a uh, something you're not happy with. Is that well, right? we, just, we talk about acute variables in training, reps, sets, intensity, rest period and one that most people do really badly is tempo. No one can control tempo. People want adaptation but they're not doing it properly. So we're going to teach you a little bit about we tempo. We include ourselves in that, don't we? No. <laughs> we're going to teach you a little bit about tempo and how you can maximise suit adaptations. Now, tempo is super important for hypertrophy if you're trying to build muscle mass. It's also really important if you want to build endurance and stability. So if you like doing longer sets, you're going to need to get your tempo nailed down. And this, I challenge anybody to do and not feel, unless you've been training tempo for ages, like it's absolutely brutal. So give it a go, but this is like a real leveler. And, and if you start to play around a bit more with tempo work in your training, you are gonna see some significant gains. So it's real simple. It's a push-up challenge, and we're gonna combine it with a cluster. And that's when we start to break down a set into smaller chunks. So Jacko's job is he's gonna get into push-up. We're gonna set him on a clock. I'm gonna start that. His job is gonna be a push-up and he's gotta do a four second eccentric. So taking four seconds to lower down, he's gonna hold for two at the bottom and then drive back up. Four, three, two, one, hold. One, two, back up. He's gonna go for four reps and then he's gonna have a 10 second rest. He drives back out, that's three. Push through one more. So he's gonna control this and then after this one, when he gets back to the top, he's just gonna check his time on the clock See how long he's got, that says 30 seconds. So he's now gonna roll through. He's got a 10 second rest period. Only four reps, that's quite Three, hard. two, one, go. Again, four seconds on the eccentric, two second hold, and then press back up. Your job is to repeat that circuit. So four reps with a 10 second rest as many times as possible. See how far you can get and see how much your shoulders and your chest are gonna thank you for actually paying attention to what science has been telling us should be the way that we train for a very long time. You can thank us later. Jack is gonna keep going. I think he's gonna have like five. Oh, and is that it? That's another two sets. All right, okay. I've got my 10 seconds rest. Have a go, post them in the comments how you get on. Let us know how many sets you okay, get three, to do. Two. If you hit 10, you're doing pretty nicely. That's 40 push-ups in probably four and a half minutes or so. We look forward to seeing you have a go and post it up on social if you want to share those with us. We'd love to see what you guys are up to and how well you can smash through your tempo. We'll see you soon. 
So before we leave you for this episode, we're going to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the School of Calisthenics over the coming months. And let me tell you, Jacko, it's a packed schedule. It is busy. One of the things that's really important to us is creating opportunities for our community of incredible people who are engaged and part of the School of Calisthenics to come together and hang out. And we have got something coming up this year, with double back-to-back, a doppio, Jacko. <laughs> that's how we like it. Which we're going to tell you about. In, 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 in June, so on the 13th and 14th of June, I'm going to go in reverse order. On the 14th of June, something that's been really popular and we really appreciate everyone that does listen to the podcast has been the Scorecard Science podcast. And we thought for the third year we've done these, uh, these live events where we bring everyone together. It's a free event, so everybody is welcome here in Nottingham. Uh, is this year we're going to go for the podcast live where we're bringing in some of the best pos- podcast guests that you guys have loved the most and uh, bring them together to, uh, to form part of this uh, event where not only are we going to do calisthenics and, and little taster sessions of calisthenics and, and have some little competitions like we did last year, um, we're also having these guests giving us a little bit of insight into some of the expertise and areas that they work in. So we've got Dr. Sally Bell from the podcast we're talking about uh, health and nutrition. We've got uh, Brian Keane, the fitness expert. We've got a handstand expert, Jonathan Last. We've got a guy from the National Circus coming to teach us about that. And then also we've got the guys from WeMove, plus a whole load more. So if all the details for that is on the website. This is what's going to happen, you know. Normally we have to work quite hard at these events. Now we've got all these people. Oh, this is literally it. going to be me. <laughs> it's really Pina like Colada. Asking a couple of questions. Again. So, yeah, what do you yeah. want? So they're all going to do, on anything. their specialist areas, they're going to do little taster sessions for you as well. So you get to come and experience not just what's going on at the calisthenics, but everything that's plugging in and around there. So if you're into health, fitness, wellness, and calisthenics, come along to that free event in Nottingham. I've that's committed on, to this. Go on, sorry. That's on Sunday. <laughs> The 14th of June, and you don't have to sign up, you just turn up, but the details are on the website. I've committed to this position, you I feel like I can't move now. There. So that then if you, want to, if you really want to get on board and uh, make a whole weekend of it, the day before, on the 13th of June, in uh, at uh, Belvoir, Beaver. Beaver Castle, which is close to Nottingham, um, is where the Midlands Tough Mudder is. Now we did this, at 25 of us got together as a team last year, and one of my goals is for us to have a bigger team um, this year. So we're gonna be doing that on the day before, so you can come do the Tough Mudder with us as part of our team. We've got a set 11 a.m. start time for that, all set up, the details, and you can, you, we do need you to sign up for that. Details for that, again, are on the website. That's the day before, on the 13th of June. Podcast live on the 14th of June. Best weekend of the summer happening here in Nottingham. And don't be intimidated by the, the Tough Mudder. We're going to have oh. a massive range of abilities. Last Dead year, easy. it'll be the same this year. It's not that difficult, and we will be doing it as a team, so yes. you're not going to get left behind. No person left behind on the Tough Mudder course. We started as a team, and we finished as a team. We did, and Jack got electrocuted, which was a highlight <laughs> of my day. But you, if you don't want to do that bit of electrocution bit, don't let it put you off. Anyway, last couple of bits, loads of workshops all over the country which you can come and get involved in, and not just this country in the UK. Outside Also, of this international, we're going to Norway, yeah. and we're doing a retreat in Sri Lanka, which is gonna be our sort of like, the, the most intimate experience that we offer, not in a weird way, but in a way where you get one-to-one individualized program by myself and Jacko. That is gonna be in Sri Lanka in December. It's selling fast, and it's gonna be epic. You need to go and have a look at the place that we're going to. On the beach, unspoiled, calisthenics, outdoor CrossFit box, unbelievable. As we record this now, there's 12 spaces available, seven have already been sold, so there's only five left, so get on board with that if you are interested. And finally, if you want any online training programs, anything else that's specifically helping you towards your calisthenics goal, you can find those in our virtual classroom, online virtual classroom, find it on the website, go there, find everything that you need, probably I would say the most comprehensive calisthenics educational and training resource available on the internet and I'm saying that because I wrote it and I put a lot into it so please go and check it out. <laughs> the other thing on that there we are there's a free beginners program and there's a free pull-up program on there so you can get to test it out uh, for free in terms of that and then there's all, you also get a seven-day trial with it so if you want to just test out all of the different programs you can get one of the memberships and try it out for a week for free. So that is the end of the first episode of the School of Calisthenics TV. I enjoyed it. It was brilliant. If you've got any suggestions on content that you want us to cover, questions, if you're going to send us your videos that we can do some video analysis on, or guests that you would like us to see, obviously within reason we can't just get anybody. We've not got that well, we much try. Kind of influence yet. We can try. But things you want us to cover, post them up. Tell us what you think about this, this, uh, this new style of content yeah. of interaction with in the Jack comments. and I. And we are very excited to see you in the next episode 
of School of Class X TV. Class dismissed.